Hello on Facebook. How are you all today? Let me hear you if you're out there on Facebook. Welcome to Cyber Bible Study. Hello, Yvonne Legron. You, you typing in all the way from Philadelphia? Now that's faithfulness. Good to see you uh, online and you know you're in our prayers. You remain in our prayers. All right, all right. Debbie Donovan, what's happening? What's happening? Uh, let me see what's happening on uh, YouTube. I got to get there, y'all, first. Y'all know I can't do two things at one time. But uh, let me try today. YouTube, YouTube. Today's the 15th, right? Yeah, it ain't out here. Let me go back. There we go. Hey, you two, Ron Davis, Peggy Wood, Deacon George Jackson. Hello, how are you all today? Let's give everybody about three more minutes before we get started today. Gail Patey, how are you? Troy, what's happening? Jabrell, hello, hello. Boy, Gail Patey on two lines. She on the main line like the Lord, the YouTube and Facebook. All right. We'll give everyone just a few more minutes, and then we'll get, uh, we'll get going. I hope everybody's having a great day. I hope everyone is staying uh, cool. It's 100 degrees outside, uh, but I'm praying everybody is comfortable. We are comfortable here at Liberty with Lucky watching the door as usual. Deacon Rose, Sam, and Joe Cooper upstairs. Juanita, how you doing? Sister Williams, how are you? Good to see you today. All right, all right. Just a few more minutes, and then we will uh, get going. All right, we got a few more seconds, then we'll get started. We'll get, we'll get started today. And Deacon Rose, I'm going to kick things off from the steps, so give you the heads up. <laughs> give you the heads up up there. All right. All right, let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for tonight, another opportunity to come and study your word. We ask God that you open up our hearts and minds to be receptive to you. God, we ask that new learnings come into our thoughts that make us better believers and more focused on your word. I thank you for those, as always, who gather on Facebook, gather on YouTube, as we go together to learn new things and be enlightened by your word. Once again, thank you, God, for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, all right, let's do a quick recap, if you will, of last week. Last week we shared with you uh, the thought behind First and Second Chronicles, uh, as simply being a historical account of the children of Israel or the Jews in the Old Testament. We talked about two primary sources uh, for First and Second Chronicles that were written after 
Babylonian exile. So this, these books were written not while things were going on, but a recap after a Babylonian exile. So we talked about two books that feed into First and Second Chronicles. That would be First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel. We also talked about books such as Nehemiah and Ezra being pertinent to First and Second Chronicles. Remember, Nehemiah would have written the account of the rebuilding of the walls after exile. And so you see some things mentioned in Nehemiah, mentioned in Chronicles. We also mentioned a book that was recorded in 1 Kings, uh, the Acts of Solomon, as we talk about different sources that make what we call, make up what we call the biblical canon that we do not have access to in the Bible. So that, that was sort of a recap of the nature of First and Second Chronicles. The next thing that we did, <clears throat> we were shedding light on the complexities of what we know as the children of Israel. We shared with you, and Chronicles talks about this, and we will do it more as we go through Chronicles. We talked about how the kingdom was unified, known as Israel, all the way up to King Solomon. King Solomon, because he had been disobedient to God, God tells King Solomon that it will happen after he dies that the kingdom will be split apart and that his son will only inherit one tribe and that the other ten tribes would no longer belong to his lineage. And God tells Solomon that the only reason why I'm leaving one tribe is out of honor for your father. And so Chronicles, and First and Second Kings, Old Testament, but, we, it, but Chronicles really deals with that and also focuses on the kingdoms. For example, uh, First Chronicles chapter 1 through 9, we talked about, gives us the history from Adam to after the exile, right? Nine chapters basically is covering all the Old Testament in a cliff note kind of way. Uh, First Chronicles 10 through 29 will cover the Davidic reign. Focuses on David. Second Chronicles, uh, beginning portion, I believe one through six, but I'll clarify and I get back to my notes, um, will cover Solomon. And then the last portion of Second Chronicles covers from David to captivity, sort of giving us that cliff note uh, version, again, for theological uh, purposes, is broke down that way. So let's rewind. Let's rewind with the study that we're going to start on tonight. <clears throat> you know, oftentimes we read God's Word and we take it for granted. And we don't step back and say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So what we, came, what we showed you last week was a simple math that didn't make sense. Here, God gives the kingdom after Solomon to Jeroboam. And he gives Jeroboam ten tribes. But yet, he tells Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he will give him one. Ten plus one is eleven and not twelve. It would seem that the writers um, miss count, miscounted one tribe. And so when you read in Scripture, it's all right to ask those questions. That I'm only getting eleven, but I know there are twelve tribes. The reason is Benjamin and Judah merged. And we're going to show you today in 1 Kings and in Chronicles, how it doesn't say that they merge, but it accounts for the tribe of Benjamin, even though uh, it had been told that Rehoboam will only get one tribe, okay? And now we're talking about that. Let me, for those of you that missed us last week, let's talk about after Solomon, how the kingdom got divided. 
We know what God told Solomon because Solomon was disobedient. And Solomon was a harsh taskmaster of the people. His son Rehoboam takes over. And the people encourage him, the elders encourage him, we'll stay with you. And in other words, we'll be a united kingdom if you're just not as harsh as your father. Rehoboam does not listen to the elders, does not listen to the people, and chooses to listen to his friends and says he will remain harsh. And he tells Israel to wait three days. Well, over this three-day period, Jeroboam, who worked for Solomon, who Solomon ran out of town to Egypt, who was prophesied in the days of Solomon to take these ten tribes, comes back. And when he comes back, on that third day, and Rehoboam is not repented or recanted, we find the tribes go to Jeroboam, and Rehoboam gets the one tribe, which is the consolidation of Benjamin and Judah. And that was important because when we did First Chronicles chapter 2 with you last week, we saw the chronicler was very intent on separating the lineage of Israel, which would be Jacob, and the lineage of Judah. And the reason why that is, is Israel and Judah, when we look at the Jews of the New Testament, are moving in conjunction through biblical history. So the ten tribes represent what we call the northern kingdom, Israel. All right? Uh, the northern kingdom, Israel. Remember, Jacob changed his name to Israel. So all of Jacob's see basically uh, David's brothers represent Israel in the northern kingdom. That's what Jeroboam, who's not of the line of David, gets. All right? The southern kingdom is Judah, and that's what Solomon takes. And Solomon takes Benjamin and Judah, which is now known as one tribe, and throughout the biblical record, Judah kings are going through things, conversing with God, as well as Israel. And so, as you study the Bible more, it'll always be good to go back and check and see which kingdom we're, we're talking about. And it's ironic that the kingdoms associated with the majority of David's brothers no longer belong to the Davidic line and belong to Jeroboam, which is what Jeroboam was told, which is what Solomon was told as well. So you have two, two uh, different groups of the same nationality moving throughout the Old Testament record in dialogue with God with their own challenges. And without, before we even go into the details, do not think Israel was the golden child. Israel was disobedient to God as well. Okay? So that'll give you a little bit of, of gravity. So, and so remember, the actual then building of the temple comes out of Judah, right? And if you ever heard the song, the line of Judah can break every chain, that's because Jesus is from the Davidic line, which would make him from the line of Judah, all right? All right, and Judah, as you know, was one of the 12, uh, 12 of Israel, okay? All right, let us, let us get into what's going on tonight. Any questions regarding that? Any questions regarding that? Let me know that you hear me because you are going to um, be asked one question tonight that will determine how long we stay on the line. Uh, thank you, uh, Peggy Wood, for uh, complimenting our media staff and their faithfulness. Um, we really appreciate that. And I want all of you all to say, hey, Joe, to, hey to Joe, Sam, and Deacon Rose. Uh, and uh, Joe and Deacon Rose are special, but you all know Sam was here with me when we was all scared to go outside. So um, I, I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you doing that. Sylvia Smith, I know you don't type much, but I see you tonight out there. I see you tonight out there. You're perfecting your YouTube typing skills. I like it. Denise Smith, Corinne, how are you? Uh, Sister Gray, Sister Francis, Jackie Thomas, Patricia Bishop, hello everybody. Reverend Gray is in the house. Barbara Griffin, Diane Tarber's in the house. I'm seeing Barbara Ellis. I saw Barbara Ellis at Home Depot on the Torrance 
uh, just a few hours ago. Etna Salter, good to see you. Virgil Donaldson, the Malones are in the house. My main man, Benny, is on the main line tonight. Katie Marie Gray is in the house, and we're just glad to see all of you all. If I missed you, I'll catch you in a minute. Vanessa, Sister Hunter, it was so good to see you on Sunday, and I'm going to give uh, Ronnie a call. I need He's been on my mind, all right? Deacon Stan, so many of you, um, and thank you for those thank yous that are coming in to uh, Joe, Sam, and uh, Deacon Rose. So let us, uh, let us get going. So let, let us just kind of clarify what's happening here in the Bible here related to just a few things. We talked about uh, Judah and Benjamin merging because a quick read falls short uh, one tribe. So let us go to 1 Kings 12, verse 21. This will be my last time um, showing you uh, kind of the, the correlation between um, Kings and Chronicles. I think you all had that down now, but this is, this is the last time that we're doing that, okay? Twelve twenty-one. When you get to First Corinthians twelve, first first Kings, rather twelve twenty-one, let me know you got it. Let me know that you got it. And then at the same time put your finger on Second Chronicles chapter eleven. And we're gonna show you. You have to do this in biblical study sometimes. See where, um, see where things are being reconciled that might not be readily apparent, okay? All right, Regina Gibson, you got it. Juanita Tarver's got it. Debbie, Sister Gray, Stan, and Diana got it. So let's go, let's go to 1 uh, Kings 12. Let's go to verse 20 and read it instead of 21. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. Those are the ten. There was no one who followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah alone. Okay? Still have that problem, don't we, with the two. With one instead of two. But then it gets clarified in verse 21. When Jeroboam came to Jerusalem, when Rehoboam, rather, came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. At this point, there's a consolidation of two tribes into one. Judah and Benjamin, after the uh, death of Solomon and the beginning of the split of the kingdom, merged, and now we have 11 tribes. But it was important... For this, for the, the writer of Kings to let us know, Benjamin and Judah merged. So of these, uh, let's, let's see what happened. And a tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen troops to fight against the house of Israel. They were ready to fight, y'all, to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying to King Rehoboam of Judah, son of Solomon, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people. Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your kindred, the people of Israel. Let everyone go home, for this thing is from me. So they heeded the word of the Lord and went home again according to the word of the Lord. So that is the beginning, you guys, of the split between uh, the Davidic kingdom into what is known as Israel, representing ten tribes, and Judah, which represents Benjamin merging into Judah, now representing one tribe that was once two. Same thing is recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 11. Second Chronicles chapter 11, which we will cover now, 2 Chronicles 11, it says, 
when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled 180, that same 180,000 chosen troops to the house of Judah and Benjamin. So now, notice, kings called Judah a house and Benjamin a tribe. Uh, in this case, Benjamin and Judah referred to a house to fight against Israel to restore the kingdom of Rehoboam, but the word of the Lord God came. So that's where we have the split, guys, um, in the Bible, okay? All right. Um, let's go to, let's, let's now get into these various sections. Let's get into First Chronicles, the first part, chapters 1 through 9, and I want you to go to chapter 6. First Chronicles chapter 6. I want to cover something tonight as a point of discussion. I want you to know um, we do not have any time to go through all the Chronicles. We could actually be in Chronicles, guys, uh, for the next five years because we would literally be going through most of the Old Testament. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm reading and studying, finding things that... Uh, can pique your discussion, your, your interests, uh, drawing relationships like we've been doing the past uh, few minutes and like we did just uh, on last week. And so kind of maybe pulling out some biblical points uh, that you might not have considered before, uh, many of which that at one point in time uh, jumped out the page at me. So we're going to go to, I want to ask you a question, and then we'll go to First uh, Chronicles chapter 6. I think we'll have a little fun uh, tonight. Um, I want you all to tell me, and I'm going to say what you think instead of what is, okay? I want you all to tell me what is a Levite, or what do you think a Levite is uh, based in the Old Testament? What do you think a Levite is? All right, when we look at the Old Testament. All right, we're going to shut it down and see what you guys have to say. All right, Joe, Joe, Joe dropped in there. He, he gave a good answer, but he, he gave it quick. So I'm going to hold on to that, Joe. That is part of the answer. It ain't the whole answer, but it's part of the answer. And see, y'all not in here with Joe, so y'all can't cheat off his paper. What do you think a Levite is? You hear this in the Bible all the time. What is a Levite? All right, uh, Sister Peggy, you and you and uh, you and Joe on the same on the same page. Juanita, you too. All right, so that's where they come from, right? They're called Levites because they are out of the lineage of Levi, who was one of the twelve sons of Israel. Okay, so right. That's where the Levites come from. They come out of the tribe of Levi, who represented one of the tribes of Israel, all right? Now, that's where they come from. So now tell me, what, what did they do in the Old Testament? Okay, a Levite is a teacher, all right? That's what, that's what Regina Gibson is saying, um, they were a race, Sister Moore, but right, right, you got it. You're wrong to the extent it, it wasn't about race, but they are races as far as it relates to them being a part of the Jewish culture, okay? Uh, they would have been considered in Babylon to be a part of the race. A guard, uh, relooks order, they also assist, assist the priest, yes. Sister Hunter, that's the, that's the distinction. They weren't priests. Good guess, though. They worked closely with the priests. And Sister Hunter, I, I, I actually 
ask the question because my initial answer years ago would have been yours. Would have been yours. And that's what, the, uh, what they say. Um, Reverend Gray, not as much of, re of a religious sect. They were part of the Jewish culture, um, but they had a role. They had a role in the tabernacle. They had, they had a daily role in the temple. Uh, and they were, and, and all these that were said here on YouTube, YouTube, y'all getting down tonight. Guard, instead of guard, Juanita, they did your job. Believe it or not, gatekeepers. Going to show you proof that they were gatekeepers. But that's guard, right? Assisted the priests, yes. Uh, teachers, yes. All right, gatekeepers, that's what Liz is saying, yeah. And the reason why, river blockers, yes. And so the reason why I'm saying that, took care of the, um, when the ark was moving, those that would have been responsible would have taken care of the ark of the covenant, absolutely. And so the reason why I shared this is, I think oftentimes when we hear this word Levite, particularly in the Old Testament context, we put them, because of their work in the temple, we hold them so high, which they should be, that we really don't pay the attention to the fact that do you know each of you listening to me right now that are actively in the church, would be considered Levites? Sam, Joe, Deacon Rose, in this contemporary time, with what they're doing right now, are Levites. Lucky would be a Levite. The ushers on Sunday would be a Levite. Levites were actually people who were actively involved and the administration of temple life. So on Sunday, and see, in the, in the modern tradition, most people come to church, and because we have so much hierarchy going on, really don't really realize the gravity of what you mean to God and what you do in the church. If you were in older times, and we were considered to be the temple Everyone who does something for service here on Sunday would be considered on a regular basis, serve the church on a regular basis. You would be a Levite, and you would live in a certain place, and you would be held to a certain level of esteem in the community. Right? People who would serve. Uh, Sister Salter, most of the, in our context, most preachers that we have now are more like priests. So the priests was separate from the Levites. We're going to talk about the priests. priests. Priests were different from the Levites. But a deacon, for example, would be considered to be a Levite. A deacon that might get up and read the scroll or may have a comment about the scrolls would be a Levite. But in our context, most preachers in the black church actually, in the church period, I don't think it's a black or white thing, operate as more priest than, uh, than Levite. And see, there was a time where, um, knowing I was a preacher, I put myself in a Levite category until I really got to look at this thing. And we're going to look at it tonight. And you'll see. So, I know I'm talking to people. I got nurses board, usher board, choir, um, people that help clean the church, people that cook in the kitchen, people that count the money, would be Levites. You would be Levites, right? And that's why it's so important for you to ask God for whatever it is he's calling you to do in the work of his church. None of us should be comfortable just coming in, sitting down, and having a good time. And you don't have to be down here every day, but engage in something that's special towards the building of the kingdom. And that's what Levites were. Let us, let us look at... Um, let us go now look at 1 Chronicles chapter 6. These, it says the descendants of Levi. I'm glad, Pat, that you're learning something new. All right? I'm glad, I'm glad that you're learning something new. Denise, we're going we're gonna to show you how they kind of separated. The Levites kind of separated from the priestly, priestly tribe a little bit. 
Yes, Sister Salter, you're a Levite. I'm going to show you how you're a Levite too. All right, the descendants of Levi, the sons of Levi. Sons of Levi are, now we're not going to read all these names tonight. I don't even know if my seminary education has taught me how to pronounce half of them. So I'm not going to butcher uh, First Chronicles chapter 6. Uh, but we got three sons, and I'm going to show you how this thing works. Okay? Um, Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. All right? The sons of Koath were Amron, Ezar, Hebron, and Uziel. Okay, are you following it? These are of Koath. All right. The children of Aram, Amram are Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. So we have, we have that. Okay? And so now, let us go here and see. We know who Aaron and Moses and Miriam are, right? Levites. Levite. Look at that Levite thing. All right? And these are the descendants of Levi. Okay? So now let's go to verse 31, where it starts to break it down. Let me know when you're there. Let me know when you're there. First Chronicles 6, verse 31. These are the men whom David put in charge of the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest. So David now selects singers, all right? And they perform their service in due order. 33, these are the men who serve and their sons of the Kohathites, which we just looked, the sons of Levi, right? They were the ones who were Levites that sang. Men that David appointed to sing in the temple. All right? All right, let's go to the second group here. The second, the second group, um, Gershom. Gershom. We went to Kohathites, Gershom. Around verse 42, uh, they go through all the people that, that are singing, and it says, son of Jahab, son of Gershom, son of Levi, was also a part of the singing. On, and then let's go to verse 4. On the left were their kindred, the sons of Merari. Ethan's sons, all of this, all of that. And their kindred, let's go to verse 48. See, I want you to see how we're covering All of the sons. We've covered Gershom, Koath, and Merari. Okay? Now, we, we see Merari in verse 44. Kindred sons of Merari. You go to verse 48. And their kindred, the Levites, appointed for all the service of the tabernacle of the house of God. So there were Levites that were responsible for all of the service to the house of God. All of the service. They were, the Levites were, were to do that. And then we have the children of Amram, which we know for biblical purposes, purposes is very important because we have Aaron, Moses, and Miriam there. Verse 49. So we got People singing that are Levites, uh, pointed for all of the services of the tabernacle. And 49 makes a distinction with Aaron, all part of the Levitical order. Right, right, Rev. You're right, right, Reverend Gray. But Aaron and his sons, this is a distinction, made offerings on the altar of burnt offering and on the altar of incense doing all the work of the most holy place, 
to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. All right? All that Moses... So there's Levites now that are doing the offering. Doesn't look familiar. Our people that take up the offering on Sunday. It's not necessarily burnt offering. I know in this context... But they are doing a service when they stand down and they pray over it. These traditions, uh, although they look different for us, are thousands of years old. Thousands of years old, okay? So, so far we got the singers, people doing the service of the church, and people in control of making sacrifices and atonement. Let's go to verse 54. And let me know if you have any questions. Any questions while we're rolling? Is this clear or clear as mud? Let me know. Let me know. That's what class is for. For you to type it and let me know before we move on. Then I want to make an, an interesting, what well, was interesting to me, I hope it's interesting to you, connection for our people that I am one day going to write about uh, in the voice one day when I have the opportunity. Clear so far. Becoming clear. All right. As long as it's becoming. All right. All right. Thank you, Debbie and Denise. Let's go to verse 54. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on it, but um, the Levites lived the settlements. Verse 54 starts with the settlements, where they were living, which was critical for that time. And what you see from 6 through 9 is we get the descendants of all of them, but the descendants of Levi represent the most extensive um, extensive uh, narration of families talking about their service, going to how they were appointed in the temple, and talking about their settlement. And I, I want to uh, deal with that issue of settlement for a moment as it relates to our plight as African Americans um, nationally. And we're going to be drawing some ties tonight to encourage us, allow us to look in the mirrors at ourselves and challenge us for where we need to go from here. But this is more of a tie example I'm giving now. When we migrated from the south to the north, one thing, as you all know, we did, most of us got involved in churches. And we got involved in churches, we did our roles, we built great institutions like Liberty, um, we built great institutions like Ebenezer, great institutions like Mount Pisgah uh, down the street, um, great institutions. And what's, what's so dynamic about how the African American journey so much mirrors uh, the children of Israel is this. When we did that, many of us settled in certain places. And where we settled, businesses began to flourish. Uh, where we settled, our churches oftentimes sat in the middle of them or in the neighborhood. So if our Levitical story was to be write, written as a people, it would be we came from Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas. Uh, we came here, and we established a church, and we were deacons, we were choir members, we were ushers, we were trustees. Uh, we cleaned the church. We worked in the kitchen. Uh, we did uh, various things, too numerous to name, or that I can recall, I can call tonight. And we did that, and we were of, and we still have it today. It was the hunts that did this uh, the Leeks that did this, the Salters that did this, the Talberts that did this, all right? 
um, all, all of those types, the Malones that did this, the Hudsons that did this, all of these things, and we all settled. And one, one, one very special thing that I had, had the opportunity to observe growing up is where I grew up on 85th and Drexel was almost like a pocket for Liberty Levites. I was on 85th and Drexel. On 84th and Drexel was Woody Talbert and Deacon Garrett right there on the corner. On 85th and Maryland was Robert Brunson, who at the time was a trustee here and a businessman. Down the street on 82nd and Maryland uh, was uh, AP sister Aline, all right? Um, and then on 82nd and Champlain, on the pocket, 82nd and Champlain was A.P. Jackson's first home. And all of us, some, and then some Liberty folks were right here around the church and played ball around the church. And, and we had, they had their Levitical pockets and their families and friends. Then there were Levitical pockets in Chatham and other places. And so that is just... It, when you look at the plight of the African American coming out of oppression and his relationship, his or her relationship with God, and you really sit back and look at the Israel Judah account of their life, uh, things that, that they did, we find ourselves 2,000 years later, or more, or more than 2,000 years later, a lot of the remnants. And it is all, it's also true for non-African American churches, but I think I'm talking to black folks for the most part right now, so I'm sharing our story. Uh, but it's really true of many religious groups, Christian groups, this whole sense of lineage, uh, the families, uh, and sometimes the families label uh, what you might do uh, in the church. And so... It, it really struck me as I was studying this and saw how important it was for the writer of the Chronicles not only to talk about what their descendants, who the descendants of Levi were and what they did, but their settlements uh, were important to the narrative. All right? All right. Let us uh, continue to move on. I hope you enjoyed that little bit of perspective uh, and, and that, little, that little bit of, uh, of learning. And so when you look at that, this is, what I, this is what has been a mantra of my biblical teaching, most of my pastorate, is I want us to look at the people in the Bible as us. That's really how we're going to break change, y'all. When we look at the Bible and we look at everything they did wrong, how they didn't follow God, yes, that needs to be noted. But when we can see them as human and see that they're, Cultural norms, although thousands of years ago, thought patterns, although thousands of years ago, in many ways, because we're human like them, we replicate it. And so the best thing for us to do is to see ourselves in them, take from them what was good, and then try not to make the same mistakes again. And I think a biblical read that is sincere about that is a more life impactful read than the one that I grew up under that just beat Israel and Judah up every Sunday school. We just beat them up, talk how they were stiff-necked, talk how they were, and never saw our own stubbornness, uh, our own faults, our own desires to want to do right but fall short. And so um, this was a positive way to show you, but it, it was designed to get us to look more inward when we learn, when we read the Bible to be better more inward uh, to be better. Okay, so that's the settlements of the Levites. Now let's go to uh, First Chronicles chapter 9, and we're going we gonna to wrap up on this tonight. I went a little bit of overtime last week, so I might cut a little short this week. Yeah. 
Yeah, Stan and say, I see a lot of people in the Bible just as we are currently. Yep. 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 And it's not because they're evil. It's because they're human. And we're human and we're born into sin and we have the propensity to fail as well. All right? We have the propensity to fail as, as well. All right? All right. Let's, let's, let's hook this thing up. First Chronicles chapter 9. We'll start at the first verse. So all Israel was enrolled by genealogies. And these are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. Now the first to live in their possessions in their towns were Israelites, priests, Levites and temple servants. That ought to jump right out of the page at you. Remember I talked on earlier of how the Old Testament, as we reading, we kind of interchangeably read Israel, Judah, Israel, Judah. And I make the mistake too. Uh, sometimes I, I, they, I, I, I jam them together as one one group of people if I'm reading a, a certain story, but I have to do a better job of paying attention to what king it is. And sometimes, I'm going to let you know, sometimes I jam them together purposely because I haven't taught you this yet. And so I don't want to confuse you about Rehoboam, Jeroboam, all right, Ahaz, and, and all that, you know, and then you're like, well, what's going on, right? So the fact that I'm clarifying now, I may have to clarify later from the pulpit, pulpit this distinction of northern kingdom and southern kingdom, you may hear a little bit more of me talking about Judah and Israel and making that distinction. But I, I, I don't because I know most of the time when I'm talking to people, even if they know of the distinction, they don't follow the distinction, right? You know, what's the difference between in the year King Uzziah died? I saw the Lord, right? Isaiah's talking from a Judah perspective. Coming out of Babylon before they went to Babylonian exile. So what? But hey, I'm getting happy right now. I'm taking y'all through everything that, that, I, that I have been exposed to. But let's stick on chapter 9. Chapter 9, we see, we read clearly here that Israel was not taken into exile. Ten tribes did not go into exile. That didn't mean they didn't have their troubles. That didn't mean they weren't oppressed. That does not mean they were the dominant culture. But Judah, when we talk about Babylonian exile, Judah was in exile. So Judah was in Babylonian exile. The exile ends, and then they got to rebuild the walls. Now, why would, why would Israel then not rebuild the walls? Because Israel was not in exile. Why does Judah come out through Nehemiah to rebuild the wall? Judah comes out to rebuild the wall because Judah is Solomon's reign. It's the birthright given to Solomon through David by God to build the temple. So the temple could not be built until Judah came out of exile. And we're going to read in other places of Chronicles where God is speaking to Israel, come back. Come back to the temple. Come, this is your right. Come back. Change your ways and come back to the temple. But the temple was not able to be built until Judah comes out of exile because Solomon built it and it is out of the line of David. It says right here. We never really look at that. It says, and Judah was taken into Babylonian exile. Not Israel. Now, Israel getting beat up, all kind of stuff. Jeroboam messed up, everybody behind him messed up, right? Just as much as Judah. But Judah is the one that went into exile. And look at here. So, after the exile, after levels of liberation, the first to live again in their possessions in Jerusalem and in their old towns were the Israelites priests, Levites, and temple servants. Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants. 
So after Babylon, because Babylon was in control, so Israel wasn't going to go in there and do nothing while Babylon was in control. Babylon backs off. And the first people that get to come back to claim the place are the Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants. All right? Again, the church folk got the promise to come back. The people that were working for the Lord. All right? All right, let's continue on. Let's continue on. Verse 10 makes the distinction that we were talking about earlier. Um, priestly families. See, there's a difference between priestly families and Levitical families. All right? So I want you to pay close attention to the chronicler makes that distinction between the priestly families and the Levitical families. All right? Um, and that, that's, that's it for that. We're not going to read those names. But let's go to, down to verse 14. Uh, if your Bible's like mine, um, we have the Levitical families. And so it starts off of the Levites and gives you the name. But uh, I just want Juanita uh, and a couple of our ushers to see uh, the gatekeepers were part of the Levitical family. Part of the Levitical family. They were critical. Um, charge of the work. Let's, let, me, let, let me read it. Uh, verse 19. Shalom, son of Kor, son of Abishaph, son of Korah, and his kindred of his ancestral house, the Korites, were in charge of the work of the servants, guardians of the thresholds of the tent, as their ancestors had been in charge of the camp of the Lord. Guardians of the entrance. All right? Ushers, you're Levitical. Your role is spiritual. This is no sign up to my friends type deal. The work of the church is not that. The work of the church is not club work. It's spiritual work. It's, are you called to this work? That's what we learned from the Old Testament. That's positive undertaking from the Old Testament. Because that's where the Spirit of God was in the temple. It was very important, these roles. Let's go to verse 28. I want you to see where our trustees are in here. Remember, there was no money. So verse 28 says this. Some of them had charge of the utensils of service, the things needed for service. All right? For they were required to count them when they were brought in and taken out. So stuff that was used in the, in the well, I don't, I don't know what they had, but let me just make it real for the day. Drumsticks, organ, chairs, taken in and out, paper, pens. They had to count them. They had to inventory them. That's business, y'all. Le Levites helping the work of the church. The utensils, the things necessary, money in our case, you know, necessary to help the church. The lights, whatever is going on, the, the utensils of the church. I would say it says here, right here. So you know where my, the, your pastor is not reaching. It says others of them were appointed over the furniture. Make sure the furniture is clean. Make sure we got so many of them to sit. And over all the holy utensils, things that we need like communion, things like that. That's why deacons are coming in there. Also over the choice of flour, the wine, the oil, the incense, and the spices. Remember, a Passover meal was very, uh, 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 things like that would have been very important um, later on. Later on, that becomes more important. But still in their worship, they would have oil, flour, things like that. So who's inventorying what we got there in the kitchen, y'all? All right? Levites, the work. Uh, verse 32, the end of verse 32, rolls of bread to prepare them for each Sabbath, right? All this was necessary. <laughs> there was a, I'm Levitical, once an usher, always an usher. That's right, I think y'all was born with that arm behind y'all back. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you are right. Okay, so I hope you guys are really getting excited about your role. I think there's too much attention placed on my role. There's too much attention placed on the head deacon's role. There's too much attention placed on the choir soloist role and not an understanding that all of us 
have a spiritual purpose. We are Levitical. We got to choose to be Levitical. We got to choose not to sit around and get into and, and, and progress, move forward the business of God's house. You are Levitical. I want you to type, I am Levitical. You are servants, okay? Um, now, 33. Keeps going. Now, these are the singers, the, the heads of the ancestral houses of Levite, living in the chamber of the temple, free from other service, for they are on duty day and night. People at church, day and night. These were the heads of the ancestral houses of Levites. According to their generations, these leaders lived in Jerusalem. Again, going back to their places. So I hope that was helpful for you tonight. Uh, I'm not going into overtime, but I wasn't able to shorten it. But here, here is the modern day lesson. The deviation that is required today that was not required then. Everything in that time was ancestral. And I think that thousands of years later, because we're human, that's where all of this, my grandmother did it, I've been in the church so long, uh, I was here when this pastor was here, I did this, all great things. But all those great things uh, oftentimes make some of us feel that we are better or more spiritually equipped than those that don't have that, for lack of a better word today, uh, family spiritual pedigree. Because a lot of that was going on in the Old Testament. And we're seeing the reason, and we're seeing the beauty of it as we tie it into ourselves. But can I talk about Christ today? The chronicle doesn't have the benefit of Christ. That's why Christ came. Because people were in bondage by their generations, who their parents were, how long they had been in the temple. And when Christ came and, the, and tore down the veil and made our spirituality accessible to all, no matter who we are, no matter what our ancestral transition, then that is no longer necessary for the service of the church. That is the barrier by which God gave us Christ to build the kingdom and make this God accessible to everybody. So this Levitical understanding that we even have today is against the love of Christ. Yes, it was important then. Yes, we can see it now. Yes, it's good to know that we are all a Levite. And some of us have grown up in the tradition. But Christ reminds us it's no longer necessary. That the son of the usher can become a pastor. The son of the pastor or daughter of the pastor can serve on the usher board. Because in Christ Jesus, there are no more slave or free, male or female, Jew or Greek. And in modern day terms, in Christ Jesus, there's no more big eyes and little U's. We all have access to be Levitical. We all have the blessing, if God calls us to, to live priestly or pastoral lives. I love you, Liberators. Thank you for being a blessing to me tonight, and we'll see you on next week. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for yet another time here. We thank you, God, for keeping us. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for enlightening us and inspiring us. And God, let us take the profound message today that you can do anything through any of us, that we are no longer bound by ancestry, social position, that, God, you reign. And may these, your people now, reach to you 
to find their Levitical purpose. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good evening. I'll see some of y'all on Sunday. Some of y'all will see me, but I won't see you. Take care.